Lord be with you. Man, didn't Zach do a great job? Just to shame the choir, you know, he's got to quit carry the choir. I mean, just to, no, good, where'd you go, Zach? Good job, man. Good job. Uh, I do want to say a couple of things. Pat, if, you know, if you want to rag on your mom's age, I'm just saying. She's your mother. She had to have you sometime. And so uh, I heard you have to pay for lunch, too, today. So. Uh, and also, I don't, I love seeing all the different generations in the choir, but they're not lining up at my door to want to preach for some reason, so... <laughs> Uh, just something to, to consider, pray about, think about. Um, this morning we'll be reading once again from those red letters, those words of Jesus. in Matthew chapters 5, verses 13 through 20. Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 13, reading on through verse 20. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, again, we pray that we hear your words, that we hear what you would have us to hear. You call us to do the things you would have us to do as you are transforming us into the people you call us to be. Be with us, Holy Spirit, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, most folks who know me, that's most of you, know that I grew up uh, in Enterprise, Alabama, just a small, it used to be a small town, now it's more like a small city down in the Wiregrass in the southeast. Lived there the first 19 years of my life, never moved from there until I went to Samford. That's not entirely true, though. We lived for one year in Daleville. Alabama, almost a year, really not long enough to, I think, even change our address. Probably didn't want to, that way the bill collectors couldn't send us mail. But we lived in a little uh, public housing development, just a little gravel road off of a county road, little curve, some houses built on a pier and beam structure. You could see right under our houses. There was a, a laundromat at the end of the road. I remember that. I have a few sparse memories there. I remember one time going to check the mail in my He-Man underoos in a members-only jacket. It was the 80s, if you didn't know. I remember one time catching a frog that was about to lay eggs and watching it in the corner in a little water because the reason the houses were up on the, the piers was we were in a floodplain, and any time it rained real heavy, there'd be a few inches of water in our entire yard. But because the house was up on those piers, we had a little landing uh, right outside the back door, and it was perfect for us, me, and my three stepbrothers, and the rest of the kids in the community, because then we could stay in our backyard and play one of our favorite games. You see, there are about eight of us in that two, three-bedroom house. I don't remember which one it was. About eight of us, and so uh, on the weekends or on school days when there was no school or in the summer, we couldn't stay inside. We had to go outside. And so we'd be out in the backyard playing. One of our favorite games was a game called Mother May I. Anybody ever play that before? Raise your hand if you played that. All right, good, because now we're going to play. 
No, I'm just playing. I'm just kidding. In case you don't know, the way it worked was we would all, now it may have been different for you, but this is how it was for us. We would start at the barbed wire fence. There was a cow pasture behind us. We would start there, then someone would stand on that little landing, and they might say, all right, Philip, take three big steps. And Philip would have to say, mother, may I? And whoever was being the mother would say, yes, you may. And then Philip would take three big steps. But what would happen is sometimes someone would say, all right, now, Nikki, you take four big steps. And Nikki would start off, ah, you didn't ask, mother, may I, go to the back. It's a simple game. One rule. All you had to do, mother, may I. Strange how those childhood games were really that simple. Like Simon says. That was what we played when it rained outside during PE at College Street. We all went in one little room. We didn't have a gym at my school. We all went in one room. Miss Smith, the PE teacher, would get us all lined up. We're going to play Simon Says. Simon Says, pat your head. Simon Says, stop. Simon Says, rub your belly. Simon Says, stop. Simon Says, do jumping jacks. Stop. Ah, I called all of you. That's the way it would go. And you'd go, one rule. Do what Simon Says. That's how it started. But then I got older, and the game started having more rules. I remember in the third grade, my mom picked me up from school, said, we're going to a rec center. I said, who got in an accident? (laughs) We went to the rec center. My mom was standing at a table talking to someone. I heard her giving him my name, my birthday, what size pants I wear. That's not information I like people having. I said, Mom, what are you doing? I'm signing you up for baseball. Back then, it was only $15 to play in Enterprise. That was a lot for us. Probably would have been now. But Mama did it, wrote the check, gave it to him. I was excited. Went there for my first day. I'd played baseball in the backyard, you know, sticks and wiffle ball bats and softballs and tennis balls and and, and old uh, ice cream bucket lids for bases. But this was the real deal. Got out there, and I looked like an idiot. I had no idea that there was a strike zone. I didn't know that the ball could go foul. I didn't know any of this stuff. Rules. More rules to learn. Of course, the older you get, the more rules there are. When I was 15, every time somebody turned 15, you got checked out of school, got taken to New Brockton, because that's where you took the driver's permit test. Everybody got checked out of school. I didn't. I had to wait till the summer. Went and took my test. I remember sitting down. There's a bunch of rules. Having to answer the questions. I handed it to the proctor. He said, you missed one. I thought, God, I've done it now. They gave me the permit anyway. <laughs> Hope it wasn't an important one. And so when you turn 16, same way. Learn these rules. Now you've got to put them into practice. When I was 16, not only did I have to learn those rules, I got a job. And about this time of year, when I, turned, I was about to turn 17, they handed me a thing called a W-2. What is that? Oh, you take that W-2 and go get a 1040EZ, and then you need some other documents with letters and numbers, and you sit down and you file out your taxes. Did you know, at least back then, when you were a minor, you still paid the state of Alabama? I paid them $18.23. I was 16. Rules. All kinds of rules. And the, more, the older you get, the more there are. Is it any wonder, then, as, as constrained and refined or as, as, as intricate as our lives are with rules, is it any wonder then that people seem to, to value a religion of rules? I don't just mean now, I mean throughout human history. It's been about rules. Oh yeah, we can look at the Bible and in the, in the biblical narrative and say, well, it started with one. That didn't go so well. And then we'll say, oh, there was ten, but you need to read all of Exodus. It ain't just ten. It's a bunch. And this is what happens when we get rules. We start wanting clarification, right? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Okay, what does that mean? Well, uh, don't do stuff on the Sabbath. Uh, when's the Sabbath? Sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. When is sundown? Well, you know when the sun goes down. But I live up on the hill. You live down in the valley. When does the sun go down? Oh, I don't know. Maybe when you can three see, see three stars in the sky. Which three? Who's calling them out? Is this what happens? Oh, okay, what about work on the Sabbath? Does that mean I just take off? Go fishing? Go play golf? What can I do? No, no, you better not do any labor on the Sabbath. So I can't sweep my house? No, you better not sweep your house. 
Can I make lunch? You better make that on Friday. Put it in the refrigerator. In fact, uh, don't put it in the refrigerator. Make something that you don't have to get out of the refrigerator. Just sit on the counter. What does it mean? You know, some of the ancient rabbis even said, if you got up from the table where you were eating without swallowing your food, it's a violation of the Sabbath. It's work. It's what happens. The rules just get more and more and more complex. What are we, well, all right, we're talking about food. What can we eat? Well, it says don't eat uh, foods that are unclean. What's unclean? Have you seen a pig? <laughs> People think this is something miraculous. I really don't think so. I think when God said it to Moses, he said, have you seen them? They're filthy. Don't eat them. But did you also know it says don't eat catfish? Uh-oh. It says, don't eat the fish that doesn't have the scales. Did you know it also said, now, if you can't eat a pig, I, I don't know if you know this. I hope this isn't shocking to you. You can't eat bacon. No shellfish. Bacon wrapped shrimp, that is a double negative. It cancels itself out. And it's in there. You cannot eat the meat with the milk of its mother. Cheeseburger, nope, nope. No cheeseburger in paradise. I'm sorry, Jimmy Buffett, it's not true. Just a burger. You cannot have the mother's milk with the meat. It's in there. All these rules, all of these, these restrictions, the older you get, the deeper you went into it, there were more and more and more and more. And then comes a rabbi out of Nazareth named Jesus. And boy, people are excited about this. People are excited. Matthew likes to paint Jesus as the perfect Moses. Uh, if you read Matthew's gospel, it's actually sort of broken into five uh, sections, like the Torah, the five books of Moses. And if you read the text that we started last week, the Beatitudes, it says Jesus was up on a mountain. Guess who else was up on a mountain when he gave his law? Moses. And when Moses came down, we know ten of the things he said and that were law. You know how many Jesus gave in the Beatitudes? Nine. You were going to say ten. See, that's how I was going to trick you. But it's not. You can actually cut the Decalogue into nine or cut the Beatitudes into ten. Doesn't matter. This is Moses' new law. But did you notice when Jesus gives them, he doesn't say, do this and don't do that. Do this and don't do that. Do this and don't do that. What does he say? Blessed. Blessed. It's a blessing, not a, a law per se. So I imagine some folks are like, now hang on, he's supposed to be a rabbi. This is his first public teaching. Let's get down to it. Where's the law? Where are the rules? And his very next words after that, you are the salt of the earth. That's nice, Jesus. Thank you, but, but get on with it. Where are the rules? Where are the laws? You are the light of the world. Okay, thanks, Jesus. Get on with it. Verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I was wondering when he's going to get to it. Thank God he got to it, because now we're going to get to hear it. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. Now that word means to fill up, to think of like a bucket half full of something, and Jesus is going to fill it up. So you can get everybody's understanding there, right? All right, here comes the rabbi. We've had all these rules. We need one for every nook and cranny of our lives. We need one to tell us everything. We need these rules for every single thing in our existence. And here's the rabbi saying he's not going to abolish them. He's going to fill them up. He's going to tell us. He's going to tell us about all the rules. He's going to set the Sabbath straight once and for all. When does it start, Jesus? He is going to set work on the Sabbath straight once and for all. What is work, Jesus? He's going to set all of those commandments down right. What can we eat? What can we eat? He's about to give us the answer. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, not one jot or tittle in the Greek there or in the Hebrew, it's not going to pass away from the law until all is accomplished, till it's all filled up. Till it's all filled out, you're not going to have to worry about a single letter being gone. Whew. That's the kind of rabbi we want. He's going to do this. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does them, teaches them, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I like where this is going. I can pull my list out. Here it is, my rules. You ever notice when you pull your list out, the don'ts is a lot heavier and a lot longer than the do's? Pull my list out. There it is. Jesus is giving me a longer one. That's good. I like lists. Whoever does them, teaches them, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and Pharisees, those who keep account, those who have their Bibles out, their Torahs memorized, going around, pointing their fingers at folks, going, aha, I caught you, caught you. It's the Sabbath day, you're sweeping your house, I caught you. Unless your righteousness exceeds them. Jesus says, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What? That doesn't work. I thought he was supposed to give us rules, and if we do them all, well, maybe that's what it is. Now we're going to get more. He's going to fill the bucket the rest of the way up, and we're going to get more. And now we can see who is really the law abiders. That's what happens, you know, when we have the letter of the law. When we have the letter of the law, it's easier. It's easier because then we can say, I do this and I don't do that. We can sit in a pew, look at the backs of the heads in front of us, and go, "Mm -hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I know him. Watched him grow up. I know what he does. At least I'm not like that. We can look at the next one. I know what she was doing yesterday. At least I'm not like that. That's what it is when we have the letter of the law. We can go down the list. We can look at folks. We can just think of their names, go, yeah, they do this, but I don't do it. They do this, but I don't do it. First time I ever heard it was when I was pastoring that little church in Texas, Osage. Someone said, well, you know the old saying, don't drink, smoke, dance, or chew, or run around with girls that do. That's what it is. If you can keep your nose clean, not do those things, you'll be good. You'll be better. If we just had the rules and laid them down and followed them, that'd be great. Then we can start putting ourselves over somebody else. Now, we don't want to do it that way. No, but you know, when it's over... When we get the grace stuff out of the way, we got to keep tally somehow. I remember a friend showing me a, a church sign, not one outside. It was in the foyer. One of those metal signs, looks like one of the street sign companies had made it, big old thing, bo- bolted right up over the door. It said, welcome to such and such church. These are our rules. Men, your hair must not touch your ears. I guess I'm out. No facial hair. Coat and tie preferred, but at least have your shirt tucked in. Ladies, no pants. Skirts must be below the knees. No heeled shoes. No makeup. No bare shoulders. That's what it said. If they're crying children, they will be escorted to the nursery. All these, there was just all kinds of rules going down the list. The final thing, though, is what caught me. The last little line said, if you have any trouble complying with these rules, please see one of our ushers, and they will be glad to give you appropriate dress. Made me think back in the foyer, they just got dresses hanging up on a rack. Or coats and ties hanging up on a rack. I don't know. I don't know. Doesn't sound like church to me. But if we got the rules... If we got the list of rules, then, then we'll be all right. Then we can go down the tally and put the check marks by the ones we follow and the ones we don't. And as long as in the end our scale is heavier than someone else's, we'll be all right. But I do wonder, what does Jesus mean, really, when he says, I've come not to abolish, but to fulfill? Some folks read that and think that Jesus means uh, that he's somehow uh, an inerrantist, uh, someone who says every little word of Scripture is true. Every little word means this, this, this. So you need to obey all of this. That's not what the word fulfill means. It means to fill up. It means to overtake. It means to accomplish, to make it final. Now, I wondered about that. I wonder, maybe he does mean these are the rules and you have to follow them. But do you know something? If that's the case, either Jesus is a special case or he's a hypocrite. Because he doesn't always follow them. There's a scene, he's walking through the grain fields on the Sabbath, picking the heads of grain. Him and his disciples are hungry. Someone catches him, ah, ah, Jesus, Jesus. (laughs) The rules say, don't work on the Sabbath. The rules say don't harvest, and let's not even get to talking about you stealing folks' grain. You're not supposed to do it. There was another time the elders pulled him aside, said, Jesus, listen, it's in the book. It's in the, it's in the rules. Your disciples are, are not washing their cups, right? <laughs> Silly, but it's there. They're not doing it. Another time... Man with a withered hand, Jesus says, let me see it, straightens it out, 
Everybody's scandalized. Can you believe that? He did it on the Sabbath. Six other days he could heal, and he did it today. Doesn't he know the rules? Doesn't he know the rules? Then in John 11, man had been dead in the grave. Four days. There he was. Jesus calls out his name. Oh, now hang on. We're not supposed to touch dead folks, Jesus. Not even supposed to be near them. Lord, I love the King James. Lord, he stinketh. Not supposed to go in there. Lazarus, come out. Here he comes. And Jesus doesn't say, wait till you make sure he's alive and then touch him. Take the, take the bandages off of him. But Jesus, the rules say, don't touch a corpse. Don't do it. It's in the rules. So what does he mean then when he says fulfill? Does he mean that every single, that he's adding more rules, creating a heavier yoke for us? What does he mean? What does Jesus mean? Well, I have a hunch. A few chapters later, Jesus has been doing his ministry, going around, teaching in parables, performing miracles. People have been wondering about this question. What do you mean fulfill the law? What do you mean, Jesus? Jesus had finally kind of put the Sadducees to rest on this. They were the folks who were really tight on just the Torah, so they didn't have all the extra stuff that the Sadducees had, but, or excuse me, that the Pharisees had. But when the Pharisees heard about how Jesus had talked to the Sadducees, that'd be like if Jesus showed up and said, you Baptists are great, I put the Methodists in their place. When the Pharisees learned what the Sadducees, how Jesus had taught the Sadducees, they gathered together, one of them a lawyer, now this is it in Alexander Shinaro, This is somebody who has studied the Torah, who knows it left and right, read it in Hebrew, has read the Mishnah, all the traditions around it, and even all the things surrounding the text, the Talmud. This is a lawyer, somebody who knows the law. Comes to Jesus and decides to test him and says, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? All right, you come to fill them up. Which one rises to the top? Which one's the best? Which one's the most important? If you had asked me, I probably would have said, do not murder. I mean, that's a pretty universal thing among all civilized folks. Don't kill one another. Don't do it. Seems pretty common sense. I'd have said that. Maybe, maybe if I I didn't have anything, I'd have said, don't steal. Maybe if I was tired of people running off with my chainsaw outside of my garage or something, I'd have said, that's the most important one. Don't steal. Or maybe if I'd been hurt by too many people in my life, do not commit adultery. One of them's got to raise to the top, right? Don't lie. That's what we tell our kids all the time. Don't lie. That's got to be an important one. Which is the greatest, Jesus? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Oh, that's good. Wait. This is is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is just like it. Jesus only says second, not to say they're ranked, but to say, don't forget, and here's the same part, the second part. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if Jesus had just stopped there, that'd be great to to quote. It'd be fine. But we read what he said in the Sermon on the Mount. I've come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. I came not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill it. And then he says in chapter 22, verse 40, after talking to this lawyer, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So what does it look like to fulfill the law? What does it look like to have a rule to guide every nook and cranny of our lives? What does it look like to have some instance, some some directive to guide everything, every decision we make from what cereal we eat to who we marry? What decision? Everything in our lives. What should be guiding it? Is there a rule for everything? Do we pull out a pocket ref, find it on what page and what paragraph, what verse? Jesus says, no, it ain't that hard. Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang every single jot and tittle. On these two hang every letter and stroke of a letter. Love God and your neighbor as yourself. That's one big law that covers them all, finds its way into every corner of our lives, and it ought to. So I ask, why don't we do it? 
let's do it. Let's obey the law. Live in the fulfillment of Christ in the law. And love God and our neighbor even as we love ourselves. For that is what this table is about. That is what this time is about. That is what our very lives are about. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we come now to a time when we will be served from your table. Lord, as we come to this time, may we purge our hearts, our minds, and our spirits of those things that keep us from one another and those things that keep us from you. For, Lord, we cannot approach this table with dissent and sin and anger on our hearts. Lord, this is a table where we are served in love, your love. So speak to us, O God, through this bread and through this cup, these gifts that you give us, powerful symbols they are to remind us of your great love for us of your broken body, and of your shed blood. And Lord, as we are served from the table, as we are served by those who sit next to us, and as we serve those who sit next to us, may we remember in the passing of the plates, God, that we are sharing in this great meal, not only with those in this room, but with those gathered around the world in your name of all different languages, of all different races, of all different places. And we share this meal with them. We share this meal with our sisters and brothers down through history. And so, God, we ask your blessing on it and that it will speak to us of your great, unfailing love. Be with us in this time, Lord, as we are served from your table. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.